Oh, good morning, everybody. Have you ever heard the saying, cleanliness is next to godliness? I'm not sure where I first heard it, but I've been aware of this saying for most of my life. But if you had tried to find that saying in the Bible, your search would have turned up nothing, because it's not a scriptural reference. In fact, the saying is pulled from a sermon of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, in 1791. I'll read this passage of his sermon for context. He said, but before we enter the subject, let it be observed that slovenliness is no part of religion, that neither this nor any text of scripture condemns neatness of apparel. Certainly, this is a duty, not a sin. Cleanliness is indeed next to godliness. From what I can tell, Wesley was referring to physical cleanliness. As usual, it helps to have some context on the time to truly understand what was being said. The values of cleanliness have changed dramatically over the years. In the 1700s, when this sermon was given, bodily cleanliness was seen in a very different light than what it, the way it's seen today. In a VOA news article written by historian Faza El Masri, she says this about personal hygiene back then. Quote, in the 1700s, most people in the upper class seldom, if ever, bathed. They occasionally washed their faces and hands and kept themselves clean by changing the white linens under their clothing. The idea about cleanliness focused on their clothing, especially the clothes worn next to the skin. The common view was that the white linen garments they wore below their outer clothes absorbed the body's impurities, cleaning the skin in the process. By the close of the 18th century, bathing was gaining acceptance amongst the wealthy as a new form of personal care. In upper class circles everywhere, men and women began to see a new value in being clean and bathing as a pathway to cleanliness. So perhaps poor Methodist preacher John Wesley was just begging his parishioners to use a little soap once in a while on those hot <laughs> English summers. Or was he on to something? Is physical cleanliness important to God? As we are cleaning out our homes and cars in preparation for the Days of Unleavened Bread, I'd like to examine the topic of physical cleanliness throughout the Bible. Does God value cleanliness? And again, because we're so close to the Days of Unleavened Bread, does God emphasize any importance of general cleanliness as it relates to our homes and possessions? This is an interesting topic for me because I consider my wife and myself to be very clean people. Kate is very mindful of keeping things clean in the sense of disinfected, and I keep things clean in the sense of being orderly or neat. In that very example, though, you can see that there are different definitions of the word clean. What clean means to you might not be the same definition of clean that someone else uses. For example, when my wife and I were dating, I told her that I'm a very clean person because I kept my possessions tidy and neat. However, when she, Kate and I were first married and she saw me clean the kitchen for the first time, she may have wondered what I knew if I knew what the word clean meant. So, too, is this a challenge with the biblical references of the word clean? What does clean mean to God and how it's found in Scripture? Let's go ahead and begin there. The first time that the word clean appears in the Bible is in Genesis 7 and verse 2. Let's just turn there. Genesis 7 and verse 2. And we'll actually start in verse 1, I should say. 7 and verse 1 says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you each seven each of every clean animal, male and female, two each of animals that are unclean, male and female, and also seven birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. So I think there's a couple of interesting points here. The first is that while this is the first scriptural reference to the word clean, it obviously wasn't the first historical use of the word, since God told Noah to gather up clean and unclean animals without explaining that definition to him, meaning Noah already knew what animals were clean and unclean. But secondly, and more to the point of this message, the word clean here has a definition. It's the Hebrew word tahor, and it is the most used word for clean in the Old Testament. According to Strong's Dictionary, it means pure in a physical, chemical, ceremonial, or moral sense. The other commonly used word for clean in the Old Testament is tahar, which means to be bright or pure. So we can see that pure is a common thread. My definition of clean means tidy, my wife's means being disinfected, and in Genesis 7 and verse 2, in much of the Old Testament, God meant it as spiritually pure. Already we're dealing with some slight discrepancies. 
Depending on the context, clean is subjective. And that's part of what makes this topic a tough one to tackle. Some things in life are black and white, others not so much. This is also a lesson that we learned during the days of unleavened bread. We can scrub our house from top to bottom, but we can never say that it's truly 100% free of leavening. The spiritual parallel is obvious. As human beings, none of us can truly say that we are 100% free of sin. We do the best with what we have. In a way, clean is similar. It's not that you either are clean or you're not clean. There's a sliding scale. Some days you tidy up the house, other days you skip a shower. But does that matter to God? And that is what we are here to discuss. So acknowledging that the Hebrew word for clean can often be translated as pure, let's look at some scriptural references where we can find the word clean and see whether or not physical cleanliness of our bodies or belongings is something important to God. Is cleanliness really next to godliness? I'm going to take a drink real quick. If we want to determine if something is important to God, the best place to start is the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Were there any commandments that relate to cleanliness? In Exodus 20, we see the list of Ten Commandments, and I'll just summarize them here. We know that the first one is no other gods before me, then no graven images, do not take the Lord's name in vain, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, honor your father and mother, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet. Even if you read the small print, I don't see anywhere where God says that we should make sure that we dust our ceiling fans more than once a year. That said, we also don't see the clean and unclean food laws here or Holy Day laws written here, and yet we know to observe them. Why? Well, because the Ten Commandments are not our exclusive lists of commands from God. And as we know from 2 Timothy, all scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We also know that Jesus summed up the Ten Commandments in Matthew 22 and verse 37. The Pharisees asked him, which is the great commandment in, in, in the law? And Jesus' response was that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself and on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In his response, Jesus is summarizing the Ten Commandments. The first four are about loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and the second six are about loving your neighbor as yourself. But what I'd like to specifically focus on here is the love your neighbor as yourself section. In the Ten Commandments, we're shown that that means honor your parents, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet. But Jesus' definition here expands that thought process to not only include those commandments, but also a much broader mindset. The word love here is the Greek word agape, which is famously known as godly love. And according to the New World Encyclopedia, the definition of agape is the following. Agape refers to a general affection of love rather than the attraction suggested by another Greek word for love, eros. It is used in ancient texts to denote feelings for a good meal, one's children, and one's spouse. It can be described as a feeling of being content or holding one in high regard. So among other things, agape is a deep caring for others, which is often why it's called godly love. And in the scripture that we just read, Matthew records Jesus telling the listeners to love or care for each other as we love or care for ourselves. So we should be caring for ourselves. I suppose that it's a given in this scripture that we would be. We want to be happy, educated, loved, successful, and so on. But we also care for ourselves physically, maybe by exercising or eating right and cleaning ourselves appropriately. There is an implicit assumption here that we are to be caring for ourselves. So we don't see any specific command in the Ten Commandments, and some of you are probably thinking that even that connection in the New Testament is a little shaky, that loving yourself could mean being physically clean. Maybe your definition of loving yourself doesn't include washing the dishes every night. So let's try to find some more concrete examples of physical cleanliness. And in doing so, I'd like to focus on three definitions of cleanliness that we'll look at today. The first one is bodily cleanliness, like being physically clean of germs. The second one is our appearance, as in how we present ourselves. And the third one is cleanliness as it relates to our possessions, like our houses and cars and so on. Let's begin with the first one on our list, bodily cleanliness. The first place that I think of when it relates to bodily cleanliness is God's instruction to the Israelites through Moses. Let's look at some of those rules in Leviticus. Go ahead and turn to Leviticus chapter 13. This is a very fascinating chapter as far as I'm concerned. 
Leviticus 13, most of the chapter reveals how to handle potentially leprous sores in one's body. But it also covers boils, burns, and other sores and afflictions. The general rule that God gave the Israelites is to have a priest examine the sore. If it looks to be leprous or severe in any way, and God gives details on what to look for for that, then the person will be isolated for seven days and re-examined afterwards. The process repeats until the sore appears normal or it's confirmed that the person is leprous, in which case they are isolated entirely until they are healed. While describing this process in Leviticus 13 and verse 6, we see God instilling the importance of washing our bodies and clothes. Verse 6 of Leviticus 13, it says, Then the priest shall examine him again on the seventh day, and if indeed the sore has faded and the sore has not spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is only a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the scab should spread at all over the skin, after he has been seen by the priest for his cleansing, he shall be seen by the priest again. So if he is clean, he is not only to wash himself, but his clothes too. And if he isn't clean, he is to be cleaned by the priest, presumably so that it can be done more thoroughly. This, of course, is germ-related cleanliness, which a concept in those days was unheard of. Not only did God tell the priest what to do with the afflicted people, but he also gave them very specific instructions as to the way the sores might look. It's an incredibly helpful chapter of the Bible as a tactical way to identify and handle illness. In fact, this and other passages like it in the Bible have trained the Jewish people throughout history to be cleaner than those around them. Oddly, this turned out to be a detriment to them in the mid-1300s during the period today known as Black Death, which was a disease spread by rats throughout Europe in large part due to the general uncleanness of the people in that age. Jews who tended to abide by the Torah, which gave them cleanliness laws, didn't die from the Black Death as much as their Gentile neighbors and were persecuted for it. But back to our topic, in Leviticus 13 and other scriptures, God emphasizes the importance of cleanliness as it relates to germs. He also highlighted the importance of isolation wherever possible. In part, this is why we encourage brethren to stay home if you feel sick or maybe contagious. Of course, we all experienced this a few years ago during the COVID-19 pandemic. But before I move on from Leviticus 13, I'd like to highlight one scripture very quickly. It's Leviticus 13 and verse 40. Verse 40 says, as for the man whose hair has fallen from his head, he is bald, but he is clean. Now, brethren, I know we have some men in here who are bald. Rest assured, they are clean. <laughs> it has nothing to do with anything. I just thought it was a pretty funny scripture out of context. <laughs> Uh, so God continues to give his people germ-related cleanliness instructions in chapter 15 of Leviticus as it relates to bodily discharges, which is another more intimate discussion on topics likely not taught in other cultures at that time. Bathing in water and washing hands are common instructions throughout this chapter, as well as isolation. So we can see from these scriptures that God places an emphasis on physical cleanliness in terms of germs and diseases, but we are also very familiar with the stories of Jesus in the New Testament, and as we'll see now and later in this message, Jesus brings a balance to all things. As I mentioned earlier, Jewish tradition held to these standards of cleanliness, maybe even a little too much in some circumstances. By the time of Jesus' life, the Pharisees had been cleaning their hands in a time-consuming ritual cleansing procedure that had developed over the years into an almost religious practice. Let's jump over to Mark 7 to see that. Mark chapter 7, and we'll start in verse 1. Mark 7 and verse 1, it says, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the traditions of the elders. So in this situation, the Pharisees are upset with Jesus and his disciples because they were not washing their hands in the same ceremonial way before eating their food. But was this a problem with germs or with something else? Let's see Jesus' response in verse 8 of Mark 7. Jesus is responding to the Pharisees here and cutting into the middle of it. He says, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and other such things that you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. In his response... Jesus highlights that this hand-washing ritual was a tradition of man, not something that had been specifically commanded by God. Does this mean that washing of hands is unnecessary in today's culture or in their culture at the time? Of course not. 
The issue that Jesus was addressing here is that the Pharisees were putting a ceremonial hand-washing ritual above keeping God's laws in other ways. They were calling Jesus and his disciples unclean when, in fact, their hearts were unclean because they had been too focused on the physical and not enough on the spiritual. They were hypocrites. I included this passage because I think it helps emphasize an important point throughout this message. It appears that keeping ourselves clean and avoiding germs is a good practice to do, but not at the risk of it becoming an obsession or the most important element in our lives. All things in moderation. And remember, the spiritual exercises in life tend to be more important than the physical. So let's move on. What about cleanliness in terms of our appearance? Technically, we can be clean but still be a bit of a mess, hair out of place or dress poorly, etc. What does God have to say about that? Let's take a look at the second form of cleanliness that we mentioned earlier, physical appearance or how we're showing up for God. Go ahead and turn to Leviticus 7, verse 19. We'll go there again, Leviticus 7. And here we'll find how God wanted his people to present themselves during certain offerings. And as you're turning there, it's important to know that Leviticus 7 is not the first place in Leviticus that the word clean is used in relation to offerings. In chapters 4 and 6, we see a common thread that ashes left over from offerings were to be left in a clean or pure place. But from context clues, it appears that clean place was probably only clean in comparison to the bloody area of the sacrifice itself, and there's really no further instruction on how or why that area was to be clean. But in Leviticus 7, we see some interesting rules on how the meat from a peace offering is to be eaten. So we'll start in verse 19. It says, The flesh of the offering that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burned with fire, and as for the clean flesh, all who are clean may eat of it. But the person who eats the flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offering that belongs to the Lord, while he is unclean, that person shall be cut off from his people. Moreover, the person who touches any unclean thing, such as human uncleanness, an unclean animal, or any abominable unclean thing, and who eats the flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offering that belongs to the Lord, that person shall be cut off from his people. So here we see something that gets a little bit more specific about how we present ourselves, so to speak. God defines being unclean in this case as someone who has touched human uncleanness, of which there are many varieties, but something like feces. It also talks about not touching an unclean animal, like a pig, for example, or any abominable unclean thing. And the word abominable here is sheketz, which is defined as a detestable thing or idol. Furthermore, in Leviticus 10 and verse 14, we see instruction to the priest of how they were to eat meat from certain offerings in a clean place. Uh, so Leviticus 10 and verse 14, a couple of pages over in my Bible here. Uh, verse 14 says, The breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering you shall eat in a clean place. You, your sons, your daughters with you, for they are your due and your sons do. So I think that there's some parallel with these instructions to our lives today. When we enter into God's presence, whether that's prayer, Bible study, fasting, attending church, etc., we should make sure that we are clean or pure and doing so in a clean place. Most of that mean, mostly that means a clean mindset with the right attitude. But it can also mean physically clean location with a physically clean body or appearance. I remember hearing from a pastor when I was at camp once that he always combed his hair before he had his morning prayer. Personal hygiene and general appearance is important to God, and we'll continue to see that in the next few scriptures. The next scripture that I'll reference as it relates to our appearance before God is Exodus chapter 28. In this chapter, Moses refers to God's very detailed instructions on the priestly garments that Aaron and his offspring were to wear at the tabernacle. Let's go ahead and read Exodus 28. Exodus 28 and verse 2. Verse 2 says, Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve me as a priest. These are the garments they are to make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons so that they may serve me as priests. Have them use gold, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and fine linen. We then go on to see in great detail all the various pieces of the, of the priest's wardrobes are to be made and designed. Would a God who doesn't care how we present ourselves go through this much effort and detail for his priests? I wouldn't think so. And the last scriptural reference I'll make re relating to how we present ourselves before God is in Exodus 34 and verse 23. No need to turn there if you wouldn't want to. This is a very familiar scripture, and we'll read this many times here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's three times in the year, all... All your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord, your, the Lord God of Israel. 
Now, of course, this scripture, scripture is referencing the three seasons of the holy days that we are currently in, of course, the spring season. The word appear is the Hebrew word rawa, which can also be translated as present oneself. This time of year and every Sabbath, we are presenting ourselves before the Creator God. Shouldn't we be wanting to look our best when we come before God? In Ephesians 2, verse 18, Paul explains that today, as we all know, we have access to the Father through Jesus Christ always. So how do we present ourselves when we're not at church? Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that we wear a suit and tie or dress nice every minute of every day, but being clean and presenting ourselves appropriately does appear to matter to God. Moving on to the final element of cleanliness that we will discuss today is that of our physical possessions. Several weeks ago, Mr. Willie gave a message on deleavening in preparation for the Days of Unleavened Bread. He addressed the point that when God initially commanded the Israelites to rid their homes of leaven, they were living in a much different time and in homes very different from what we live in today. As he said, they probably tossed their leaven cakes, swept the dirt floors, and were done. But he also made the point that to whom much is given, much is expected. We have all been blessed with homes that have multiple rooms, furniture, cupboards, vehicles, and so on all of which need to be taken care of and kept clean. But because times were so different, there isn't a lot of direct correlation from the Bible that we can pull from. Instead of homes, people had one-room clay dwelling spaces or even tents. Instead of cars, they had mules or oxen. So with that in mind, let's do what we can to see whether or not God cares about how we care for our possessions. I'm going to start by looking at the temple built by Solomon. Much like our earlier example of looking at the priestly garments and how the priests were to physically present themselves before God, the temple also has a lot of detail in how it was built. In 1 Kings 6, we can begin reading of the painstaking detail, and there's no need to turn there, that God inspired to be kept in our Bible. In that chapter, it talks about dimensions of the inner sanctuary, the, the outer wall, the cedar beams used as paneling in the interior walls, the pure gold overlays, the olive wood carved cherubim statues, and on and on it goes. Everything in the temple was built with such intention, and God chose to leave those instructions for us to read thousands of years later. I believe that there's so much detail with this temple because this is where God dwelt with his people. It is the most important structure ever built, the place where God can commune with the Israelites. So it makes it even more awful to consider how it was treated in later years. Decades later, after the split of Judah and Israel, one of the worst Judean kings desecrated the temple of God. In 2 Chronicles 28, we can read that passage. Let's go ahead and turn to 2 Chronicles 28. 2 Chronicles 28 and verse 23. 2 Chronicles 28 and verse 23, it says, For he, which is King Ahaz, for he sacrificed the gods to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him, saying, Because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin to him and all of Israel. So Ahaz gathered the articles of the house of God, cut into pieces the articles of the house of God, shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, and made for himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem. So he cut up and destroyed articles from the house of God, and then shut the doors, preventing the Israelites and the Judeans, from gentri- excuse me, the Judeans from entering in and turning them to paganism. His son, Hezekiah, despite his father, was a great king and undid the damage that Ahaz had done to the temple. We see that in the next chapter, 2 Chronicles 29. In the very first year of his reign, Hezekiah commanded the priests and the Levites to help sanctify the temple, and they did. We can see that in verse 15 of 2 Chronicles 29. It says, And they gathered their brethren, sanctified themselves, and went according to the commandment of the king, at the words of the Lord, to cleanse the house of the Lord. Then the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, and brought out all the debris that they found in the temple of the Lord to the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it out and carried it to the brook Kidron. After that, they performed a sin offering and began to make things right with God. I think it's important here, at least in the context of this message today, that the first thing that Hezekiah needed to do before he could fully make things right with God was to clean his house. We've only looked at a section of this passage, but Ahaz didn't just desecrate the temple. He also established pagan altars throughout all of Judah, which Hezekiah ultimately destroyed, but Hezekiah started with the temple. Now, our homes are not technically the same thing as the temple of God. But as we referenced earlier, we have direct access to God today. So we don't need the priests and the animal sacrifices and the physical building of the temple to reach God. 
Should we be caring for our homes in the same way? It's an interesting thought. Another consideration is that while you may have bought your home or have the lease on your apartment, ultimately God owns everything on earth. We see that in Deuteronomy 10 and verse 14, where Moses wrote, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth and all that is in it. Are we taking care of God's property? This reminds me of a parable that we all know very well, which is the parable of the talents found in Matthew 25. Go ahead and turn to Matthew 25. We won't read the whole thing. I know this is a very familiar passage. But we'll just read the beginning of it to set, the, set up the context. Matthew chapter 25. And we'll start in verse 14. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And one he gave five talents, another two, and another one, each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five. Likewise, he who received two gained two more also, and one who had received one dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Now, I think we all know how this parable ends. The two who had wisely invested their talents, came back with more money, were praised by the wealthy man, whereas the servant who buried his talent was called wicked and lazy. The lesson of this parable is that we are to do something with the talents that God gives us and improve upon them as we prepare for our roles for the kingdom, in the kingdom. However, in the context of today's message, I think the same lesson could be applied to our physical belongings. God owns everything, as we've just read, and he's blessed each of us with our own belongings. What are we doing with those belongings? Are we leaving our house a complete mess? Are we properly taking care of what God has blessed us with? So today, we've looked at three examples of physical cleanliness. Bodily cleanliness, physical appearance, and the cleanliness of our possessions. What is the takeaway here? Do I expect you to clean your houses from top to bottom every week now? Will I ever get an invite from somebody to come over to their house after having given this message? Well, I think with all things, there is a balance. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3 that there is a time for everything, a time to build up and a time to break down, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. And in verse 8, he specifically says a time to keep and a time to throw away. God can and does see us 24-7. He'll see us messy, clean, and everything in between. And the same goes for our homes. We cannot expect to be clean all the time. The point is that we should be putting in an effort and treating our belongings and ourselves with care especially when we come before God. And that's, of course, why we dress up in suits and ladies wear dresses when we come to church every Sabbath. We are coming before God, and it's important that we look our best. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention the infamous passage in Luke 10, verse 38, which is the short example of Martha. Let's go ahead and turn there. Um, this is our last scripture that we'll turn to this morning. So go ahead and turn to Luke 10, and verse 38. So it says in verse 38, it says, Now it happened, as they, went, as they went, that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Here is the perfect example, yet again, of balance that Jesus provides us with. Martha had busied herself so much with cleaning and preparing a meal for him that she was ignoring the fact that Jesus Christ was in her living room. We can't let physical preparation become more important than spiritual engagement. So all that said, is cleanliness next to godliness, like John Wesley said? Today we've looked at many scriptures that have shown that cleanliness is very important to God. It's a sign of respect, it's a sign of good health, and it shows that we care and love, agape love, about ourselves and those who come in contact with us. In this season, while we're cleaning our homes, vehicles, and possessions of leavening, remember the spiritual implications of doing so, which we have heard and will continue to hear in messages around the days of unleavened bread. The most important lesson to take away from this time is that we are to rid ourselves of spiritual leavening. But don't forget the physical takeaways that we receive from this season as well. Being clean and taking good care of ourselves and our belongings is very important to God.